Hello, everyone. Very good to have so many people with us tonight. I'm very excited. I'm Edith Bedeketli. I'm a journalist, and I will be uh, moderating this talk with Edgar Keret tonight. He probably needs no introduction for the people in the room, but still thinking that there might be some first timers here. I would like to do a brief introduction, if that's okay with you. Do so Edgar Keret is obviously one of the most popular writers among Israel's younger, but also obviously um, pretty much everyone in Israel, like readers, the, uh, a few generations, I guess. And he has also received a lot of international acclaim. Sorry, I have to do this looking into your eyes, but <laughs> he wrote five short story collections, a children's book, two comics, along with works for film and television, um, the numbers might need some updating, but uh, we'll hear it from him, I guess. Now my mic's off and I will continue. <laughs> um, well, you, your work has been translated into like 45 languages, more than 45 yeah. languages and more than 40 movies, am I right? Uh, have been based on your stories, short, no? Try my mic. Your mic. So we take one yeah. mic on. Maybe it won't have that. Yeah, this is actually better. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, I was just mentioning that he wrote several short story collections, a children book, children's book, two comics. Uh, many movies have been inspired by or uh, based on your work, and his work is in forty-five or more than forty-five languages. He lives in Tel Aviv and um, he lectures. You still do lecture or yes, he lectures at Ben Gurion University um, and he has several awards. I'm not going to name all of them here because it might be a little bit boring and Wikipedia-esque. So, um, well, he won Camera Door at Cannes Film Festival, I think, with uh, the movie that you've just seen before the conversation here. So, well, these are the Wikipedia kind of info. Uh, and for me, some interesting facts. Your name means challenge, and you give a lot of importance to that, I know, and we'll come back to that hopefully. Um, well, Edgar had a very rough and what he likes to call a heroic birth story. Am I right? Yes. And um, he is the third child to parents who survived the Holocaust. And you think that your family is a microcosm of Israel. So these are some interesting facts for me that are not in, on Wikipedia. You sound like a very cool person, a very successful person. So, uh, well, very warm welcome to Peron Museum and Istanbul. Edgar, very good to have you with us today. So now this um, screening was supposed to happen a few years ago during the pandemic, but then it got cancelled. So why don't you start by telling us about how you survived the pandemic. I mean, you did a short movie about the pandemic itself, but tell us how it has been for you. And I'll give you the mic. Thanks. Uh, well, I think that, you know, the pandemic is, was a little bit like a relationship. You know, you have all kinds of phases. You fall in love and then you get used to each other and then you start fighting. But I can say that, that the, when the pandemic came, I couldn't help thinking that I was uh, better prepared for it f from, than most people. Because the idea is that uh, when you're a short story writer, then every morning when you wake up, you say, what am I going to do today? You know, maybe I'll be a pirate or a hired killer or a transgender or a, a baker, you know? And then you say, yeah, and you sit down and you do that thing. And and I think that when you are novel, write novels or when you have a stable working place, then the force of inertia is very dominant in your life. You know, you go, you take the same bus and you go to the same work and you talk to the same people. And when you write a novel for years, you know, you meet your characters and you see how they grow up. But it, but. A short story writer is a little bit like somebody falling from a cliff, hanging to a branch, and then the branch breaks, and then it hangs to another branch. So this idea of kind of not really knowing what's going to happen 
It's mm. uh, something that I'm used to. And being all day closed in a room, not meeting other people, is also something that I'm used, I'm used to. So I, I would say that for me, Corona was just my way of saying to people around me, you see, the way that I live is not that easy. You see, now that you have to live this way and wake up and not go to work and think if you want to cook something or work out or whatever you want to make up your day from and you have to do that every day, it, it can be challenging. But for me, it's it, it just my default way of life. And you, well, you fell out of the pandemic, you said, because it's like a relationship. So how did that happen? Yeah. No, the truth is, again, I, I think that, uh, that we live in a very, very specific age, you know, a, a interesting one, but uh, uh, like my son said, he said uh, that if humanity is a Netflix series, then apparently we're living at the last uh, episode of, of the season, you know, because he said, because too many things are happening, you know, so there's no way it's going to be resolved, you know, it's going to be a cliffhanger, you know. So, so I, I, I feel that this is a very, very challenging time. But what happened, I, I thought that, you know, I think many times storytellers, uh, they have some kind of a different, different story, like the, or maybe human beings in general, we see something and we tell ourselves a story and until other people, Say no, no, we have another story to tell about that we're not aware of it. And, and for me, there was something about the pandemic that uh, I actually felt that it would uh, kind of teach people that, uh, that we can't live only as individuals, that we, we endure and fail as societies. You know, it's like uh, the fact that uh, Americans who were rich and worked out and were very handsome would go on the street and get, catch COVID from a homeless guy that actually could not afford a living. For me, it was kind of like a moral lesson saying, you know, it would be either good for all of us or it's going to be bad for all of us. But then very quickly, I saw that, the, that it's like a Russian stand. Everybody sees in it what he wants because right wingers and fascists said no 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 what corona tries to teach us is that we shouldn't let people outside of our country come and if they're from different race if they're asian or something you know they're trouble or you know or for example in israel during the pandemic they had this uh, system that uh, would trace all the phones and without you using any app would say, oh, this guy was next to a COVID patient, a COVID uh, uh, carrier or something, so we have to put him in quarantine. Now, this system was surprised, uh, it was served to us by the Israeli Secret Service. And, uh, you know, because they track people all the time and do this kind of thing. But what happened was that it was uh, so effective that at some stage many people say, maybe we can use that after the pandemic. Maybe they can track our phones all the time and then this way everything will go more smoothly. So, so I realized that it wasn't as if we're going to go through the pandemic and learn a lesson and necessarily become li more liberal or nicer, but that we will come out of the other side of the pandemic probably uh, more of the same, we're more convinced of our convictions, were, whatever those convictions were before. Okay. Okay. So you've touched upon some of the interesting um, themes and, um, I guess, ideas when it comes to, you know, when we all think about the pandemic. And one of them for me, which really has a dialogue with your work is post-truth. And as I was getting ready for this uh, event, I was thinking about your work and I was just saying, look, his work, you don't really enjoy, um, you know, rooting your work in what people call reality. I mean, I don't know if that exists and you could, of course, have this postmodernist skepticism about what truth is, but obviously that's, um, that's something interesting about your work. And I want to hear what you think about uh, this whole uh, fuss going on about the idea of post-truth. 
well, I, I think that, uh, that uh, when people will look at this period from the future, if we have a future, I think they're going to be very critical of it. You know, it's like I always say that people who lived in the Dark Ages, they didn't know that they were living in the Dark Ages. They were living in, the pre in their present. But what I feel is that the, we, the, this era, it's an era of implosion. It's basically people are living inside themselves, inside their feed, inside their truth, and they really have a, no, what we knew as society, this kind of thing that is exterior to ourselves, and we look at it and we say, oh, we don't like what society wants us to do, but I guess we have to do it because it's society, you know, it's kind of crumbling and crashing down. And I think that individuals uh, these days become more and more like consumers. They want to get service, you know, they want, it's like, it's like, I think as an artist that uh, when I, I turn on Netflix and they say, you can see the movie in 150% speed and uh, uh, we can find you a movie, tell us what you want under two hours, naked women, happy end, we'll find you one, no problem. Then basically it's kind of a, the way that we position ourselves to, uh, uh, when we meet the world, is that the world is there to serve us and, and that we're not getting the service that we want. That's why we're all so angry, you know? And, and I feel that uh, a lot of people during this kind of identity theory, you know, fighting for Afro-American rights, or fighting for uh, homosexual and lesbian rights, or fighting uh, 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 for female rights, then what's very, very specific for this age, that the moral uh, uh, wrong that we're fighting against always has to do with us. You know, when I was young, or if, uh, less so, but because there are less such opportunities. But the demonstrations that I went for was uh, for gay marriages, for Palestinians getting the wrong country, uh, for equal opportunity for women. Now, I wasn't a woman or Palestinian or homosexual, but I had an agenda of the way things should be done. And I think that today, there is some kind of a system that uh, people are tapping to their own pain and they want, they, they want out of sense of victimhood some kind of justice, kind of a vigilante justice, you know, they want to lynch the people who make them unhappy, but very much so lack some kind of a, a an overview of reality, seeing reality not through your emotion and pain and and the feeling of victimhood, but seeing the world as a whole in which you are just a tiny uh, rock in space, you know, and something that is greater than you. And I, I really, really feel that, that uh, when the moment that every person fights for for what is right, you know, I'm not saying that it's wrong, for only his group of people and when they're, they're differentiating people so much, you know, it's really, it's like, you know, when Will Smith slaps somebody on stage, is it a, a male toxicity or maybe it's Afro-American toxicity or maybe it's rich movie stars toxicity? Who needs this terminology? You know, the truth is much simpler than that. When Will Smith gets on stage and slaps somebody, he lives in a world in which you think that if somebody done you wrong, you cannot count on the system to protect you, so you have to protect yourself. And this world where we outsource more and more a, a functions that usually soci society uh, puts on other people and, and I don't know, when we see documentaries to think or we sit over there and say, uh, is Amber right or is it Johnny Depp that is right? Did Woody Allen harass his daughter or did he harass his daughter? So I'm saying, when I open TV, I, my work is not to be a judge, you know? I want to see narratives, I want to agree things, but, but uh, even this thing, it becomes some kind of a reality show. 
It's like, I, this guy doesn't sing, I don't want him to go to the final. He can't dance, I don't want him to go. This guy is a pervert, I want him to do it. This woman, she's lying, you know? There is something about this kind of attitude that I really feel that is very, very kind of uh, self-centered and many times uh, mistakes between morality and self-interest or morality and entertainment, you know? We see so many Netflix documentaries about people who are fucked up and wrong and serial killers and I don't know, whatever, and they be, uh, or Tinder swindlers and they become some kind of a, 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 a cultural heroes, but all the time we feel that we kind of we interact with this kind of reality. I'm not sure if anything I said made sense, but uh, it was just this old guy ranting, you know. <laughs> We're here to hear you rent, so it's all fine. But uh, what I meant was like, a lot of your work is highly speculative and it all, like a lot of your work almost creates a per parallel reality. And I've heard you say many times before that storyteller is a liar or in your interviews, you're not always very honest and you enjoy that and you make it a part of your identity, a, a, a playful part of your identity. So in that sense, when I was thinking about you, I was just thinking, post-truth is pretty much what he was trying to do with his work or maybe not post-truth, but beyond truth or, you know, truth was not really your thing. In that sense, I was wondering where that puts your work when yeah, it comes to yeah, uh, so, so what, what I was trying to say is that I think in many of my stories is that, that there's always many narratives to a reality and that the, actually the narratives that are not the default narratives are many times the more interesting narratives because, because I think that, that uh, let's say, when, usually when you see something, you have a default story. You say, oh, I don't know, this guy ran down a bog and ran away. But the story is that this guy, uh, his boyfriend just dumped him and he's on ecstasy and uh, he took his brother car and he can't work the, the handbrake. And I always felt that there was some kind of a, a benefit of a, a perceiving reality a, from, from an angle in which we usually less perceive reality. But I think the outcome of that was not to say a, a, the truth is, is, is not of the matter, but to say Many times when we think that we talk about an objective truth, we're doing nothing more than basically tell people how we're feeling and how we're experiencing things. So, so I think that in a sense, it, I wasn't, I, I wasn't writing this way uh, to celebrate uh, the fact that we cannot agree about anything. I was just doing it, trying to kind of point it out. I actually, in my newsletter, I must say that I have this kind of a, a kind of text that I want, that I, I call them a alternative, a, a alternative fan facts or fan alternative facts. And for example, I wrote a piece about the idea that a, 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 I claim that it's true, is that in the future people would inv invent time travel, but the, the thing is that when you travel to the past, you can't go back. And the further you go, the, the more weight you lose. So the idea was that in the beginning they tried to tell people, how about you go and live in different times? And people refused. But then they say, how about you're going to lose some weight and you have to live in a different time? And then what I claim is that many dominant figures in our time, they basically fed people from the future, like uh, Steve Jobs, is this kind of fat guy from the 22nd century as it came. And, uh, and that the truth is that Jesus was this really overweight guy who lived in the future. And he said, I want to be so skinny that I can walk on water. And they said to him, oh, but we'll have to send you like 3,000 years back. He said, I don't care. I want to be so skinny that I can walk on water. And then it's kind of a historiography. It's basically, oh, it's kind of, all our history uh, was decided by 
overweight people who were not happy about the way they looked and they kind of they went back in time. So, so I mean, when I write those kind of things, I don't claim that this is the truth, but I claim that you know that when whenever you look at reality in a in a different way, then it kind of exposes something that, that you can't always define. But I don't know. When I wrote this text, I think it's about basically how in the end. Uh, whatever, whatever ability we have in this age, it will be leveraged by marketing. You know, in the end, it doesn't matter what we can do. It's just, it just matters if you can sell it. You know, I have a friend who, who is developing a, a, a cure for some genetic disease, but nobody wants to put money in it because it's a rare disease. So they say there's no market for it. So, so basically, you know, so when I write about this, it's not about time travel. It's about how we really just want to leverage everything to make money, you know? So it's, what I'm saying, it's not really that I'm rebel, rebelling against truth. It's just that I'm, I want to kind of, I think that, that my feeling is always that uh, it's like kind of, when, when I was young, we had those black and white TVs. You are all young, you don't remember those ages. And when they, never, when they didn't work, you would hit on them, you know, puff, and then the image would maybe kind of uh, get better, you know? So I think that in the story, they kind of try to hit on reality, hoping that maybe the image will get slightly clearer. Well, should I believe this story? Because obviously you said so many times now that I reminded myself that you like lying or like you, you like not being that honest in interviews. Or... Well, for sure, I'm not from the future because I'm chappy. <laughs> <laughs> and well, this is, this is a good point uh, and it brings to me to my next question, I guess. Uh, you obviously use a lot of humor. Um, and in this day and age, obviously, politically correctness is a buzzword that a lot of people are submitting to. Uh, in that sense, to, I mean, referring to this joke you made about overweight people, what do you think about politically correctness? How does it fit into humor in general? You know, again, you know, I, I talked about Netflix before, so it's really, really funny because, you know, as somebody who is also a scriptwriter and filmmaker, then it's unbelievable how uh, today, if you want to uh, create in any platform, then regardless of what you want to say or what your artistic aspiration is, you have to commit to really to so many rules. You know, it's really, I, I was saying on the other room that I was trying to develop a, a TV series and I worked with a wonderful American producer and basically it was a crime story. And in the crime story, in the end, the murderer uh, was a Native American. And he said to me, look, we can't do it that the murderer will be a Native American because it's a minority. The only way we can do it is if one of the main characters will also be of the same minority. And then we say that we don't claim that Native Americans are murderer. We show that, and I said to him, okay, you know what? The, the detective, I can write him as a Native American. He said, no, 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 you can't because you're not a Native American. <laughs> so, I, so I'm saying, you know, I, I, I read Sana Silverman, you know, saying that, talking about Jew face, like black face, saying that people who are non-Jewish can't play Jews, you know? But that's why we call it playing, you know, we're acting. You know, somebody can say, I'm Jewish and he's not Jewish because, you know, this guy can also say, uh, I'm from outer space and he's not from, I can say I'm a superhero. That's, that's the idea about acting. So what I always felt was that the, the thing about art, that art was excused from the pragmatism of reality. Basically saying, in reality, you have to behave. When you do art, you can ventilate all those kind of suppressed emotions and feelings that you can show in in the real world. This is the, this kind of, you know, biblical times, they had those kind of safe cities. So if by mistake I would kill somebody from another family, I would go to the safe cities and those are not allowed to kill me, you know, or like a Catholic confession. Here, it's, it's, you can say whatever you want, it's okay. And now I'm living in an age where actually art is super regulated. It's basically, people are not interested if your story is good or if it's not good, but what does it say about reality? Does it mean that this or 
can it uh, help transform good values? Very much, by the way, like Christian polls, you know, where, oh, this tale is not Christian, you're not uh, supposed to, to do it. So, so art is very much being regulated while life is go going going right. So if I see Netflix fiction series, I can assure you that there will be good representation of uh, minorities and genders. But if I see Netflix uh, a documentary about exotic Joe, or, or, or if I see dancing uh, with stars with the woman from exotic Joe that allegedly killed her husband and fed him to the lions, then this is okay. We just have to make fiction look right and then live in a, a shitty unjust life you know and this is something that it's really like uh, taking the problem and then turning it, it on its head i don't mind reading lolita as long as a part of pedophile doesn't bother my child and now i wouldn't want people not to teach lolita i would just want pedophiles not to touch my child. This is, this is the goal, you know, when we read Shakespeare, when we read Antigona, you know, Greek people or, or people in Shakespeare time, they were not that thinking about how, a, a, I don't know, emperors or slaves are being presented. They wanted to talk a level above that, about some kind of a human futility. And, uh, and now, today, I feel that th as, as somebody who uses humor or something, my, by the way, my wife says, it's a matter of time before you get into trouble. <laughs> she said, you, you, uh, you are like, a, you are like a, an Asperger guy. You don't understand the world that you're living in. You think that a, a being truthful is a value that people appreciate, people don't like it. And she said, like, you know, I love you, but you have to be careful. You have to talk less, uh, less funny, uh, less How extreme, extreme example. No, no example about you crapping on stage, you know, or making love to the moderator or saying that the microphone is like a joint that we give to each other. You know, just say, say those straight things because I really, really want you to go back home unshamed and intact. And, and I'm saying is it really is it in in my head it's really the, the stage is like I don't know like we talked about Native Americans it's like you know Indian people they believe that uh, that crazy people were holy people but we, I don't think that you know that crazy people are holy people but I think that it's nice to be in a society when somebody is doing something not pragmatic like he's not trying to steal food or money from himself just saying weird stuff and telling weird, weird story that you will have the same protected status that Native Americans gave to the crazy people in the world, you know. So I want to be modern society crazy guy, you know, the people who say stupid, don't play with him, but the people will not say to me, don't say your crazy shit, you know. I mean, I'm just saying it, I'm writing stories, they're not real, I destroy, I destroy the universe, but after you finish it, you close your book and the universe still exists. So I feel that it's really, really important to, to leave some territories open in which people can uh, ventilate their emotions and thoughts. Hey, I can give you a weird example, okay? It's like an only given stage. Whenever, whenever I see somebody working with a cane, I have an urge to kick the cane. Okay, now I'm saying when I say I have an urge to kick the cane, it's not that I have an urge to see somebody who's wounded or elderly falling to the ground. It's just that I don't know, I saw too many movies and I see a cane and I say, well, what would happen if I go like this? You know? And I say, if you go like this, a man would fall and he will be hurt and you don't want to hurt him. You're a nice guy, you're a vegetarian, you, you grew up a rabbit. It would, it would not be right to kick a cane. And I totally acknowledge that. But the question is, when does somebody like me, who doesn't go to a therapist, can share this fault of me that whenever I see somebody with a cane, he wants to kick the cane. So I could either say it on stage and get into trouble with the 
invalid society of people that will say that Netflix shouldn't buy my series because I preach that people should uh, be mean to, I don't know, evil people, or I could write a fiction story about it and get criticized for writing a story of this horrible guy who has those thoughts of kicking a can. Well, this horrible guy is me, so, you know, I still have a couple of years to live among you people, so give me, give me one, one alley, one place where I can just say what goes through my mind. You know, it's okay, I'm not going to do it. I just want to say that I think it. I'm confessing. I, I go to police and say, arrest me, policeman, but let me say it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, uh, you said before that you're influenced by Jewish diaspora writers that are famous for their humor, obviously. And you also said in an interview, or perhaps your documentary, sorry that I can't reference it right now, but uh, in Israel, you don't really have humor anymore. I mean, I'm speaking of Jewish writers, of course. Yeah, and you said that Palestinian writers are carrying on the Jewish sense of humor. Yes, that yes. Uh, what I think that we we have a lot of humor in Israel, but I would say that it's not a homegrown humor. You know, it's like, I mean, people are funny and sharp and uh, and I don't know what is exactly is Turkish humor, you know, but but uh, I think it's most, like, I don't think that there is a Belgian humor as opposed to Luxembourgian humor, you know, it's like people are genuinely funny. I think that what was unique about Jewish humor was the idea that Jewish people were were, peop were people excused of nationality, you know, because Jews moved between countries and were not always welcomed us, so so they were, they didn't have they didn't see the world in this kind of idea of uh, patriotism, you know, what it means to be Israeli or to be Turkish or to be French. It was just like me and my family and this neighbor is a nice guy, but the other guy I don't like him, you know. So the perspective there was something more humanistic about it. And also, I always say that Jews in the diaspora, they had two tier thinking. They were thinking on two levels, because let's say if you're a Turkish Jew, then <clears throat> you could uh, walk in the street and see some kind of a Turkish demonstration for, I don't know, a closing places that serves uh, alcohol. And you say, oh my God, those Turkish people, they're crazy. And you can say it as a Jew. And then you go to a synagogue and you see the people instead of praying all the time they are on the phone and you say, oh my God, those Jews are fucked up. And you can say it as a Turkish, you know? And, and this, this is something that the uh, immigrants or oppressed uh, part of the society, they, they uh, have that. They, they have this kind of leverage to see something from one point and then to see it from the other. And this was something that was about Jewish humor, it was special, that it was very reflexive. You know, I think that the uh, uh, Jewish humor, the, all the jokes are about the people who are telling them. It's like, you know, if you listen, I don't know, to Woody Allen, his jokes are about himself, about his mother, about his father, about his uncle. Like, you don't waste a joke on a stranger, you know? You, you only make fun of the people that you care about. And this is unlike, let's say, American humor, that in its nature, it's a very alienating humor. When you go and see Dumb and Dumber, it's not that the people who watch the movie say, oh, I'm dumb, and the director who did it is dumb, and Jim Carrey is dumb. Isn't it nice to see people with movies about your community? It's like saying, I'm smart, the director is smart, Jim Carrey is smart, and we're making fun of these dumb guys that live there. So there's something very alienating. I think that in Jewish humor, there's something that kind of heartwarming and, and healing in its nature. And do you think this tradition continues? So I think that it doesn't because I think that, uh, that first, I want to say that you usually find humor uh, among uh, people who can change their own reality. It's like, you know, I mean, I mean, if uh, I always say that when I, I was in compulsory army service, all the time we made jokes about our commanders, but our commanders never made jokes about us because they could just 
precious, you know, you really need. So, so you know, it's many times like when you can't change reality, but you don't want to accept reality, then you know is a way of saying, you know, I'm really not happy with what's going on, but what can I do, you know? And it, it's kind of a way of keeping your, your self dignity. And I think that, you know, the Jews in the diaspora, they were always in a sense uh, politically or physically in, in free opposition, and they needed to rely on the humor. Now Israel allegedly had, has one of the strongest armies in the world, so we really don't have to be funny, you know? We can be funny from time to time, but but this kind of uh, survival need to be funny kind of disappeared. And by the way, if you look, let, I don't know, in, at American or English humor, you would see that most of the funniest people are, they are not uh, born uh, raised white Americans. They are like, you know, they could be Afro-Americans, they could be, I don't know, UCK is Mexican, you know. They always come from a place where they can see uh, the American see, uh, society from outside, and they always come from a place of kind of weakness that you know helps them to kind of equalize things. I just want to say that I want to turn to the floor soon, but I still have questions, but just for you to get prepared. Um, so where does that put you? You gave us a picture of Israel, Palestine and Jewish humor and your work, your understanding of politically correctness, etc. So there is that picture and you as a left wing liberal living in Israel right now. And I mean, uh, if you Google Israel today in Turkey, two funerals would come up and it's very ruthless for people to see what's happening there most of the time. In that sense, where does that put you, Edgar Keret, and your work full of humor? I, I, again, you know, I, I think that, that humor is usually a last resort, you know. I always say that the humor is like an airbag in a car. You don't have a button to press the airbag, but if you're going to hit the wall, the airbag is going to inflate, you know. So, so I feel that uh, I need humor because I feel... Uh, in a sense, I don't know, oppressed or or a, a, a minority made out of one guy on this planet, or misunderstood or unable to get to 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 get my the people around me to the place that I want to. So I think that that you know, kind of always come from this uh, uh, frustration or inability to close the gap and. In that sense, you know, I may be kind of a, a Israeli and Jewish and a, I don't know, when upper middle class and all those kind of nice things. But in the end, I still feel that there are so many things that I want to do and that I'm blocked by doing. That there are so many ideas that I have and that the people, I, I, most of the people don't share with me. So when I feel that, I can either be bitter or be funny, you know, I, I don't know of a third choice. Okay, well, um, you know, you said that you don't really enjoy the politically correct narrative that's very prevalent right now around the world. Do you sometimes have the urge, sorry, this is a very tricky question, but do you sometimes perhaps have the urge to submit to that tone when talking about Israel-Palestine? Topic the, the 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 conflict. I mean, yeah, but 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 but, but you know, I really think that there is something about politically correct correctness in its definition uh, that it's about a, a reduction. It's about saying, oh, this is very simple. You know, you don't say the N word, and everything is going to be great. You know, and but but the idea is that the uh, the N word exists even if we don't say it, you know, and, the, and not, not, not saying it doesn't necessarily make race, racism uh, exist less. But the fact uh, that, that we put all our weight on this kind of thing means that at the same time we're neglecting other things, you know, it's a little bit like you. You pay your dues, you pay your taxes there, and you speak this, this speech. But I say, you know what? Say the N word. But when when your daughter 
uh, dates an Afro-American, be nice and don't say nasty things to your wife and don't, you know, and say the N-word. Okay, that's a better deal. I do, I'm not willing to close a deal with you in which you'll be able to say those few words and get away with it. And I really want to say to you that, that these things of uh, political correctness or controlling the narrative, which many times reminds me of, again, you know, Spanish Inquisition for that case, which is levels that I wrote a children's book, and in the children's book, in one of the pages, uh, uh, the father goes to his children's room, and there is a brother and a sister, 12 years old and 8 years old, and they sleep in separate beds in the same room. And the American publisher said, I will not publish this book unless you will make a new illustration in which the children live in separate rooms. And I said, why? And they said, because uh, it is insinuate uh, sexual perversion. And I said to them, but I grew up with my sister in the same room, and we never had sex. I'm willing to go to a polygraph, you know? And actually, it was very cozy, you know? I liked being with, with my sister in the same room. She would, we would talk at night, you know, after we turn off the light, and it was nice. And the reason we were grew up in the same room wasn't because our parents want us to, us to fuck around. We grew up in the same room because my parents couldn't afford two rooms. And the answer that I got was, uh, we don't want uh, uh, to judge uh, uh, your parents' decision-making process. Uh, and uh, but, uh, in the bottom line, if you don't change the illustration, we will not publish your book. And me, you know, I want to live in a world where it's okay in a children book to have a sister and brother sleep, sleeping in the same room. Now I know why your wife is worried about you listening to your <laughs> stories. <laughs> now I really want to turn to the floor. I mean, I have so many other questions, but uh, I know that people might be curious. Now a question by someone who's not wearing pink. <laughs> No, the way it's beautiful. Thank you. Well, it's probably more colorful than you, but um, <laughs> anyone who has a question, perhaps? I can give my mic. I have a mic. Hi, hello. My name is Tom. Over here. Uh, I'm having fun. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of nervous. Uh, so I've read most of your short stories. Like, I've read every one except for the last book, the Galaxy and something. Um, and I've noticed that there are zero healthy romantic relationships within your stories. And I've just wondered for years why. Uh, it's a question I've got like for actual years now. Yeah, so I can say for myself that you know that uh, I'm happy married and I've been with the same woman for the past 27 years. Uh, but I think that, that you know, that uh, let's say when, when I teach uh, 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 creative writing, I always say to, uh, to, to my students that there are so many great uh, love songs about unfulfilled love. You know, there are many, many songs and poems about somebody loving somebody, but that it doesn't work. And there are very few good songs about people who are in love and are happy together. And I said the reason is very, very simple, is that because if I'm in love with, with somebody and she doesn't want to see me, then I stay awake all night and I cry and I write a poem. But if I'm in love with somebody, who wants to see me, I'm too busy to write a poem. You know, right now I'm making love to her, so please write your own poem, you know? So I think that, that you always write about, a, about frustrations. You always write about faults, because when everything, I would say that if the world would be perfect, there would be no art, because there would be no need for art. You know, it's really when everything is good, I don't have any ideas for stories, but when I uh, break my nose on the pavement, I write four stories that week. Because, you know, 
Because what kind of a dumb guy would go in the middle of the street in Arnhem, Holland and decide to head by the pavement, you know? This is dumb, it's painful, you know, it's unbearable. So I, I write a story about it. And what I want to say is that in my in my stories, I think that my, my stories are describing a an exa exaggerated facets of uh, problems that I could have with my wife. So let's say if, I don't know, if, if uh, uh, I bring home a rabbit and uh, my wife would be unhappy about it, then I can write a story about in which my wife brings home an alligator and it eats our child, you know? So this doesn't mean that it happens, but, but it means that I kind of try to digest or deal or reflect on something that that I felt. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, so you said you lead a solitary life. Most of the time you're alone in the room, trying to write. But your stories are so kind of extraordinary, like you explained. So don't, I always used to think that writers are in life, in the streets, observing people. So don't you ever observe people or uh, what, where does your inspiration come from? This is the first question, but I have another one. I can continue later. Yeah. So, so I, w I want to say that, is that uh, uh, I kind of, I was saying I live uh, with the same woman for 26 six years. The sex wasn't, you know, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, I also want to say that I live in the same apartment for 29 years. And uh, when our child was born, everybody said we have to move. And I said, no, no, I don't want to move. And basically, uh, I didn't have any space to write in because it's a very small apartment, but it had two toilets. So I turned one of the toilets to my studio. I mean, we took, I took the toilet out, but it is very small. And one of the reasons that I don't want to give up on our apartment is that it's a first floor, you know, not ground floor, and that we have a balcony. So all day long I sit in the balcony and there is something very strange about people, but when they go in the street, they don't look up. So when you, when you sit on the first floor balcony, you know, for 20 years in a row, you get to see people talking and fighting and kissing and punching each other all the time because, because you're, you're totally invisible. And, and there is something about it that uh, I, I really like to be around people but to feel invisible, you know, I also like to be around people and to be visible, but, but there is something that I really, really enjoy, that I have the ability to look at people for a long time, what they're doing, the way that they're doing, and I really don't feel that I'm spying on them, it's just as if, like, I feel that when I look at them, as if there is this kind of, I don't know, this secret code uh, of humanity, and I say, you know, you only get it when you when you experience people when they are unaware, when you, when you are able to see the gap between what they think they're doing and what they're doing, only by that you can learn a little bit more about them and maybe about yourself. Okay. And in one of your short stories, suddenly a knock on the door, uh, you write something like, in Middle East, you can't be kind. You have to ask for something, get it. You can be rude, but in Sweden, you can be kind and get you enough. So do, why is it like this? I, I want to say to you that, you know, that uh, in my reading event in Stockholm, when they read this sentence, but in Sweden, everybody's nice, the entire audience laughed. You know, so really, they really perceived it as uh, something humorous, and I think it is something humorous. When I wrote it, it wasn't a fact, but some, somehow the yearning of people who live in the Middle East to be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, in Israel, we had a, a, a group that was very popular when, I don't know, in the 80s or 90s called Ethnics. Mm -hmm. and, and they had a hit song called 
to live in to live in New Zealand. <laughs> and it was called to live in New Zealand when the, the only time you hear the sound of cannons is on the Queen's birthday. This was like the song, you know. And it was huge. Now I really think that you know most Israelis if they would live in New Zealand, they would drown themselves after a week. You know, it's beautiful, but it's so unbelievably burning. I wouldn't want to live in Sweden either, but for me, it really, it was more important to use that to, to show how Israeli people see themselves more than to say something about uh, Swedish people. And I think that, you know, it's funny because I wrote this story 10 years ago or 12 years ago. And at the time, you know, this idea that to say, if, uh, if you want something, you have to take it by force, you know, you have to be rude, you don't have to. Now, this kind of sentence sounded very Israeli for me 10, 10 or 12 years ago. Today, it sounds universal. Today, I think people everywhere kind of share this kind of feeling that there is no justice. It doesn't matter if you right wing go in the US, you will storm the capital, you know. If you are a liberal in San Francisco, you will boycott McDonald's for sh uh, showing a girl with a belly button outside in a commercial. You know, it doesn't matter. You have your set of things, but, but the idea is that the entire dialogue that we are having with the world and with ourselves it became this kind of dialogue, an aggressive thing, saying, I have to take what's mine because nobody will listen, because the world will not do me justice. And it's funny because I think that many things that functions in this world, they function on some kind of common belief. You know, when, when I drive my car and there is a, a, a green light and I drive, I don't look to the sides because I know that nobody's going to hit me, you know? And that makes driving a little bit easier. But when there is something socially that is not functioning, that basically I really feel like, you know, there was a time where I didn't drive, but I was in a car in places like in India, where people drive to all directions, whenever they want. They go, even go up and down with the cars, you know? <laughs> then basically, you are always in this kind of anxiety and saying, you know, I don't want anybody to hit me, I don't want to run down any, anybody. And I feel that we, right now we're a society that really kind of uh, doesn't believe in standing in a red light. Because everybody's corrupt, and they're going to anyway, so I'm going to drive in a red light. And and this could kind of create a reality that would feel like a series of accidents. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, one last question, because we're almost out of time. Yes. It's an honor to have the last one. Uh, I wanted to ask you about Alphabet Soup. I'm a recent reader of it, and I really enjoy it. I wanted to ask uh, how the idea came up because on one hand, you write short stories and Alphabet Soup is like shorter, shorter stories that you make it to the book. Uh, have you ever thought about, I don't know, Twitter that is even shorter, short stories or where does it come from? So I, I have to explain to people that I have this newsletter for the past nine months or so called Alphabet Soup and it's on a platform called Substack. And the thing was that when, when uh, the pandemic started, I realized that, you know, that I was very creative and I wrote a lot, but uh, I didn't have the ability to meet readers or audiences like I do now. And the thing was as if like my stories were like uh, screaming into a well, you know, because even if I wrote something and it was published in a magazine, I really never, didn't have any interaction with with readers that didn't have any feedbacks, and I really missed that. And then I thought maybe I can start publishing stuff on Facebook. But then I realized that the people on Facebook, you know, the way that the algorithm works, you know, they say, oh, I'm bored, show me something. Oh, this looks like a nice cake. Ah, this guy's in Seychelles. Oh, short story. And this kind of attitude is really not good for readers saying, so when somebody says, I'm really, really bored and can't be bothered to be active about my decision, so would you want me to write read your stories? And I say, no, man, you know, go do something else. I don't know. And, uh, 
And then I discovered the, the Substack platform, which basically means that you do a newsletter. And the newsletter people need to give their email and subscribe to it so the commitment is stronger and you can get feedbacks and you can do stuff that I couldn't have done before. For, for example, I published the poetry. My poetry is not good enough to be in a book, I think, but the, in the newsletter, who cares? You know, I can write to you a silly joke I made when I had a shower and it's still okay. And at the same time, I can do all kind of collaboration because in the newsletter, I have this thing called the matchbox stories where, where the, the, the people give me ideas for stories and in the end I write an, a story from one of people's idea and they dedicate it to that person. So there was something about it that you know, that in the beginning I thought maybe I'm, I'm going to write very bad stories from that, but it would be nice because I, it would be an activity, but in the end, so far, I actually wrote good stories from that. And you know, and uh, those stories that will probably be in my next book. So I don't know, there's something very healthy and fun about it. And you're all invited to join. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.